Welcome to a special edition of CNS News. I'm Julia Chan. Tonight, we bring you nine stories, each produced in one day. After a major earthquake destroyed much of Japan's east coast, local organizations are raising money for the victims. Patty Espinosa reports. Fundraising efforts for Japan are well underway after an earthquake 81 miles off the coast of Sendai devastated the country. The Consulate General of Japan in San Francisco has set up a relief fund bank account. On the very first day, we started to uh, receive calls and emails inquiring um, how we could donate, how, how people in the Bay Area could donate. The 8.9 magnitude is Japan's largest quake to be documented since recording began in the 1800s. The earthquake set off a deadly tsunami that wiped out several areas and caused the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant to become unstable. Um, we have set up the operation room uh, at the wake of uh, this earthquake and tsunami disaster uh, to gather information and uh, to uh, figure out what the communities needs. The consulate plans to send the donations to the Japanese Red Cross Society. Many Bay Area Japanese are looking for family and friends that were in Japan at the time of the earthquake and haven't yet made contact. They are calling the Japanese consulate for help. But, uh, since uh, Friday morning, we've been receiving uh, just about 400 calls. The death toll has reached the thousands, and people within a 20-mile radius of the nuclear plants have been evacuated because of concerns of radiation leaks from the reactors. Food, water, and gas are scarce, and the financial state of the country has taken a turn for the worse. To be able to feel that people are concerned about what's happening in Japan, concerned about the well-being of people and the well-being of those uh, in the affected area, that uh, makes us feel that, you know, again, we are not alone. Bay Area organizations and businesses have started their own relief funds, too. Ichi Sushi in San Francisco is donating a portion of their dinner proceeds to the Red Cross, and their support efforts don't stop there. Ichi Sushi posted on their Twitter page that they will host another fundraiser called Hugs for Cash in Peace Plaza. If you would like to make a donation to help Japan, here are some options. You can donate online at causes.com or redcross.org. You can also text Red Cross to 90999 to give a $10 donation. And of course, you can send a check to the Consulate General of Japan in San Francisco. I'm Patty Espinosa reporting for CNS News. In the wake of controversial hearings on Muslims in the U.S., Faye Abul Ghassim looks at the impact the issue is having within the Islamic community. Today's hearing will be the first in a series of hearings dealing with the critical issue of the radicalization of Muslim Americans. On March 10th, New York Congressman Peter King ignited controversy by leading hearings to discuss terrorist threats posed by American Muslims. Today, we must be fully aware that homegrown radicalization is part of al-Qaeda's strategy con to continue attacking the United States. Al-Qaeda is actively targeting the American Muslim community for recruitment. During the hearing, King called out the local chapter of the Council on American-Islamic Relations for publishing a poster on its website telling its followers not to cooperate with the FBI. That poster did go up on our website in January. It came down a few days later, and the reason we took it down was because we were concerned that it could be subject to misinterpretation, as it was by many in the right wing. Zahra Bilou is the executive director for the Bay Area Chapter of CARE, America's largest Muslim civil liberties organization. She says King has wrongfully singled out the Muslim community and her organization. CARE is targeted because we're a civil rights organization, because we are specifically challenging individuals like Congressman Peter King and various others who are perpetuating a climate of, climate of fear targeting Islam and Muslims. And so Stephen Fish, a political scientist at UC Berkeley, says that these hearings could create a climate of fear reminiscent of the McCarthy era. Typically, in the States, um, we haven't had we haven't had this kind of thing. Of course, we all know about Joseph McCarthy and his hearings against the suspected communists. But to actually have congressional hearings that are aimed at a particular religious group or ethnic group's loyalty is indeed very unusual. The hearings haven't reached the status of the McCarthy era, but some Muslim leaders like Iftikhar Hai say the discourse in Washington could perpetuate hatred against Islam, and his American-born granddaughters are paying the price. They say, Grandpa. Why is it that they are picking on Muslims? You know, so there's a psychological hurt on that. 
While Muslims have faced discrimination, many in the Bay Area are hopeful that the Peter King hearings will not affect American sentiment towards Islam. And here at the Islamic Society of San Francisco, they say they're committed to furthering the conversation. All that we have to do is to make alliances. We have to make coalition. And you have to work together with the American people in making this country a better place for everybody to live. This is Faye Abul Ghassim reporting for CNS News. California is facing a $26 billion budget deficit this year. But how do we fix it? UC Berkeley professors asked state voters. And as Carl Nassman reports, their answers could affect education funding. California voters don't want new taxes, but they don't want to cut programs either. That's what professors here at UC Berkeley found after the release of the first UC Berkeley field poll. The public always says, you got to make cuts. It's important to make cuts in general. But then when you ask them about specific programs, they say, no, not that one, no, not that one, no, not that one. With the largest budget deficit of any state, California lawmakers will have to cut something or raise taxes. UC Berkeley political scientists wanted to ask state voters how they would solve the problem. So they partnered for the first time with the field poll, an independent survey of statewide voter opinion. The results were not surprising. The results we have here are typical of what we get with polls like this. On the one hand, people don't want new taxes. On the other hand, they don't want to cut services. That's a standard result in public opinion research. But the poll did find that voters are more willing than before to make cuts. One example, cuts to higher education. Three years ago, 71 percent of registered voters opposed cuts to universities. Now that number has dropped to 64 percent. And that worries student activists like Christina Orista, who climbed the roof of Wheeler Hall in early March to protest budget cutbacks. That really concerns me because I feel that, you know, people are very well in intention in, in, in trying to get through this economic recession and trying to build up California again, and so they're, they're willing to make these sacrifices. But government studies professor Jack Citrin, who helped design the latest field poll, says student protesters shouldn't be discouraged by the numbers. People are, might be reacting negatively to all the complaining and protests and whining that has been going on, but I don't think that's had an impact. I think for students, uh, the good news is that the higher education continues to be something that the state of California, the people in the state of California care about. Budget-related protests continue across campus, but students and residents may soon get a chance to vote directly on Governor Brown's tax increases in a special election as early as this June. Reporting for CNS News, this is Carl Nassman. As California schools face budget cuts across the board, one nonprofit is stepping up to prepare Richmond High students for careers in science and technology. Mark Oltmans reports. Yeah, we started doing little, like, like little tunes. Just a year ago, Richmond High sophomore Jesus Hernandez was thinking about dropping out of school. I was bored at school. At first, there was nothing to do here. So I just, man, I just told my parents, I'm tired of school. But then Jesus found out about a new engineering program at Richmond High. The result of a partnership between the city, the county school district, Chevron, and an educational nonprofit called Project Lead the Way. We're introducing students to the kinds of careers they would never otherwise see in high school. Aerospace engineering, biotech engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. Project Lead the Way provided the rigorous engineering curriculum, and Chevron put up the money for teacher training and a lab with 35 new Dell computers. Jesus says it's kept him at school. This is a class that I really push my work into. And other classes, I really don't. This is the only class. Throughout California, school districts have lost 10 to 15 percent in funding a year for the last two years. On top of that, Richmond High is struggling with a dropout rate near 50 percent. This class offers an hour or two hours a day for them just to focus on engineering, math, science, anything that they can apply to. The students who come and say, well, okay, I'll keep going to my math and science and English classes as long as I can take that engineering class because I see where that fits in my future. You're changing kids' lives. Jesus is one of 66 students enrolled in the new engineering program. He says it's helped him to see the career path in his schoolwork. And it was, this is a really fun class to be in. And I hope later in the future I'll be an engineer. This is Mark Oltmans reporting for CNS News. With prom season approaching, 
A Bay Area group is helping thousands of teenage girls make that special but expensive night a dream come true. Christina Lopez has more. Standing in the rain on an early Sunday morning might not make a girl feel like a princess. But once inside, girls like Oakland High senior Sophia Liu can begin their search for some royal regalia from among the 6,000 dresses on these racks. I just hope that I could find the dress this year. Nearly 800 girls from as far east as Sacramento and as far south as Palo Alto walk through the doors of the Princess Project this weekend. The project's goal is to make the prom more affordable by providing free, slightly used dresses and accessories. The Princess Project is important because the average cost of prom has continues to rise. So right now it's about over $700 for a teen to attend prom. So what we're trying to do is take a little bit of that burden off of the families. But the question remains, will they find that perfect prom dress? I don't want anything bright. Or you don't want anything bright, so you want a little more subtle. For Lou, the challenge isn't finding a dress, but finding the dress that will make her smile. The Princess Project takes a dedicated team of over 100 volunteers to store, rack, and pack 6,000 dresses. Meredith McNeil has been volunteering with the project for six years. would like to try and have so that the girls feel like they have choices. There's usually about three options per girl that we try to serve. So we're shooting to have about 1,800 girls come through San Francisco this year. That's a lot of dresses. After getting measured, sifting through racks of dresses and multiple trips to the dressing room, Lou's search is over. The time from start to finish, four hours. It makes me feel like a princess. I hope everyone found the perfect dress. This is Cristina Lopez reporting for CNS News. Petfinder.com has helped millions of animals find new homes. Becca Friedman reports on the free website celebration of a big anniversary. This month marks the 15th birthday of Petfinder.com a free site connecting potential new owners with adoptable rescue animals at shelters like the Marine Humane Society. They have a feature where you can say you're looking for a black and white cat within 25 miles of, of your zip code and um, you, you hit the click button and all of a sudden you've got a list of the criteria that you're looking for. Since its creation, PetFinder says it's played a part in over 17 million adoptions. But it's not just their website alone. Increasingly, sites like Facebook and Twitter have become another way for us to reach out to our supporters and potential supporters. YouTube also is, has been an incredible resource for us. Of course, uh, a photo of an animal is, is really compelling, but even more so being able to take video of an adoption animal. While the benefits of online adoption ads are plentiful, Harrington warns that the Internet has some downsides as well. You might go on a website and see a picture of um, uh, a farm-looking environment with nice green pastures, and a lot of times that's all for show, and the animal arrives sick, uh, they're shipped uh, by airplane, not great conditions, uh, and then when you actually do some investigation, you realize that um, these places are really puppy mills. But Harrington says the benefits outweigh the negatives, and many check out the website before searching in person. Petfinder.com has increasingly become the go-to place for people to look for adoption animals online. First online, then I come to the shelters and I make a lot of visits. To celebrate their anniversary, Petfinder suggests that web surfers replace their Facebook profile photos with photos of adoptable pets and it supplies links for tweets and blogs that will promote animal adoption online. This is Becca Friedman reporting for CNS News. <laughs> Following the death of one of its most influential performers, members of an iconic San Francisco theater group came together to celebrate her life. Caroline Binns has the story. Actors and enthusiasts came together on March 13 to remember actress Sandy Archer, who passed away in October. In the 1960s, she was a performer in the San Francisco Mime Troupe, a political theater group that successfully fought for the right to perform uncensored in the city's parks. It was founded by Ron Davis, who organized the tribute. In the 60s, we charged ahead, opposing the war in Vietnam and the establishment of bourgeois culture. Our members included composers, filmmakers, theater people, street kids, and a bunch of nutcases. The troupe used a new kind of radical theater to lash out against the establishment. Yeah. Yeah. Join the mean troupe and help us to undermine conventional attitudes toward money, morality, and sex. Actor Peter Coyote was part of the mime troupe. 
He shared his memories of Sandy Archer. Sandy Archer was the perfect wedding of this mime, radical politics, zany humor, and total dedication to social change. Do we have to talk about this kind of stuff, or do we just have to do? We try to make the people in the parks, the people who come to see the minstrel show, see that these problems exist. But if we ourselves get down by these problems, like right now sitting around feeling depressed, that's a bunch of crap. For me, Sandy Archer was radical theater in the 1960s. Sandy Archer and the rest of the mime troupe left a mark on political theater in San Francisco that continues to this day. This is Caroline Bins for CNS News. After 25 years without its own marathon, Oakland is hoping to draw runners back to the city and change its image. Kevin Fixler has a preview of the second annual Oakland Running Festival. During the last weekend in March, neighborhoods like Lake Merritt will be filled with thousands of runners and spectators as part of the Oakland Running Festival. This is not just a foot race where people kind of, you know, traipse through your community. This is something that everyone in Oakland has a good deal of civic pride about and are expressing it in cheering the, the, the runners along. The three-day event was a boon for the city's economy last year, raising an estimated $2 million. And officials say it's a win-win for Oakland. All of the city services are paid for, so there's nothing being passed on to the taxpayers. It's nothing but gravy for us. The goal is about $3 million. You know, as more and more out-of-towners come in and check out the event, it obviously builds more revenue and helps out the economy. Um, Although some minor changes were made to the course this year, so it now begins at Marriott City Center, festival director Gene Bertolic of Corrigan Sports in Maryland says Oakland was prime for an event of this kind. I mean, we knew that if we brought our model from Baltimore, that it would work in Oakland, especially when a, a city that's as fit as Oakland and has neighbors that are just as fit in San Jose, Sacramento, and San Francisco. But event organizers continue to contend with Oakland's reputation as a high crime city. However, they say the lack of an incident in 2010, as well as increased participation numbers this year, suggests that such safety concerns are unfounded. There are no safety issues. We have police officers or course marshals on every section of the course. We like to tell people you have to be one of the dumbest criminals to do something on the course that day. I think if you haven't been here, you might be swayed a little bit, uh, influenced a little bit by some of the, uh, uh, some of the reportings in, in the press and, and some isolated comments. But, you know, to know Oakland is to experience Oakland now uh, and, and really get the, the true flavor of our city. Long term, the city and festival organizers hope the event will turn into a world-class competition, bringing in much-needed funds and an improved image of the city of Oakland. This is Kevin Fixler reporting for CNS News. And finally, Justin Jewell shows us why San Francisco is still the city of free love and free other things. San Francisco is famous for being one of the most bike-friendly cities in the world. It's also one of the most liberal, which means it can be hard to walk outside your door without running into cyclists, weirdo activists, and even nudity. But seeing it all at once is pretty rare, and it can only mean one thing, critical ass. We're at uh, Justin Herman Plaza, and we're going, in about an hour, we're going to go ride around San Francisco with no clothes on. Otherwise known as World Naked Bike Ride, this motorcade of chafed flesh and body paint is a celebration of San Francisco values, of the freedom to let it all hang out in a city that won't judge you or arrest you. In San Francisco, it's, there's, there's no uh, problem with you. I mean, as long as there's no sexual content to it. Welcome to San Francisco! <laughs> of course, the ride also has a point. Basically, we stick our bare buns out to show that uh, the rear end of cars are a lot stinkier and bad for the environment than our naked bodies are. But does it make any sense? Um, it's pretty weird. <laughs> I don't know why they do it. Do the tourists understand? Uh, we are Brazilian and I, I want to, to be naked. And isn't anybody offended? There is no respect for other people. There's a lot of kids around here. That's true. But it didn't seem to bother this guy much. What do you think? Well, do they have Pretty to funny. <laughs> and besides, even if the message doesn't get through, there's still something to be said for going out and having fun. It's just so free to be naked. Nakedness. Nakedness. 
This is Justin Jewell reporting for CNS News. This has been a special edition of CNS News. I'm Julia Chan. Thanks for watching.